is Daniela Norris on All Books Presents, podcast and interview series. All Books publishes great books on the mind, body, spirit connection. And today, my guest is Francis Trussell, author of You Are Not Your Thoughts, The Secret Magic of Mindfulness. Hello, Francis. Hello, Daniela. Wonderful speaking to you, and I absolutely love the title. You are not your thoughts. <laughs> Thank you. So what is your connection with your thoughts if they're not part of who you are? Ah, well, that is the big question, really, isn't it? So, so often we get so swept up in the busyness of the mind. And certainly for me, I, I lived huge swathes of my life. Uh, just lost in my thoughts uh, and for me that was not often a very nice place to be and so our thoughts are yes one part of our experience and of course it's a very useful tool being able to think it has enabled us to create all of the incredible things that we've created as a species uh, however if we're constantly focused just on thoughts then we're missing out on a huge range of our experience and this can really kind of uh, cause a filter on the way that we are experiencing our lives and actually um, if we change that relationship to our thoughts and recognize that yes they're a useful part of experience but just one part of experience and we learn to widen our focus and experience more of what's going on for us directly rather than through that filter actually life comes alive it just feels so much more real and wonderful when we're able to be where we are in the moment rather than constantly lost in the world of the somewhere else, which is where our thoughts tend to take us. So uh, it's a really important thing to do as a human being is to look at this relationship to thought and to, uh, and to see what's right for us, to see what's true for us. So your background is in broadcast journalism. How it did is. you become um, mindfully happy? <laughs> so, uh, for me, the world of broadcast journalism, I think I was always a bit of a journalist, really, from a very early age, had um, a bit of an obsession, really, uh, with news and current affairs, and uh, presented on hospital radio from about the age of 14, and, and uh, it was a massive part of my world. Uh, I trained and very quickly was very lucky to get some kind of fantastic uh, placements and kind of move through that world. However, there was an enormous amount of stress involved. And certainly, I think in part, this kind of conditioning of I'd conditioned myself from the first thing I did when I woke up at whatever time in the morning was kind of switch on the news. And the last thing I did before I went to bed at night was, you know, catch up with what on earth is the most horrendous thing happening around the world right now. And, and actually, I can see that over time, um, this definitely changed the way that I was experiencing the world. We only have a certain amount of bandwidth I suppose for for what we can take in and um, my focus was very much uh, on what was going on uh, everywhere all of the time and that can kind of really take us away from from being where we are and for me the stress of a very kind of high pressured career uh, really took its toll I had periods of uh, depression which I kind of acted my way through and secretly I was kind of hiding in bathrooms panic, having panic attacks uh, and suffered with absolutely terrible anxiety but on the surface really uh, holding things together but over time that kind of uh, incongruency with um, who I really was and this kind of role that I was acting became too much 
and it led me to explore all different types of therapies and all different types of ways that I could uh, perhaps find some inner peace and then when I found mindfulness it was just the most remarkable a bit like falling in love really uh, I went from being incredibly depressed and anxious to having a very different relationship with life a very different relationship uh, with my thoughts everything suddenly became very vivid and bright and so much better and from there I absolutely knew that I had to teach I was compelled to share the peace and the joy that I had found and that's kind of how Mindfully Happy was born and I went off to do lots of teaching and uh, and with my intellectual head on, do lots of learning too, but actually learn along the way that it was more this um, this process of unlearning, really, of allowing these things to unfold and finding that level of simplicity and reality that's there all the time, but we can't necessarily see it or feel it because we're so lost uh, in that filter that is our thought. I can really relate to what you're saying, and I think that a lot of people who don't necessarily um, have a spiritual background, perhaps like you and I, um, and then they come across mindfulness, and perhaps it is life-changing for them because they could be the ones who need it the most, isn't it? Um, what, what is mindfulness um, in that sense? Yes, well, uh, certainly, I, I mean, I've gone on to talk, teach many, many hundreds of people. And yeah, it's incredible. It is, um, it really spans everybody that so many people do come to it uh, to just escape the stress. Uh, but actually, when they when they find that simplicity that is already there, it is an awakening and lots of people have a, a problem with this kind of word spiritual or uh, anything slightly that they that they feel is woo woo and and actually um, but there's there's absolutely no denying that what mindfulness points to is this deeper sense of ourselves and whatever labeling you want to put on that but actually, uh, it's really, for me, I always describe mindfulness as having your mind full of what you're doing when you're doing it rather than filled with the thoughts. So it's, it, but what that really points to is kind of we go through the mind, but we almost transcend the mind when we're in this state of mindfulness. We go through the mind, but actually we enter this state of fullness. And we discover for ourselves what it is to be really fully alive, really fully awake to that direct experience of life. And that creates huge shifts in people, creates huge shifts in their awareness and uh, great levels of insight into how they've been perceiving things and how this has been causing them pain and anguish which they can just learn to let go of and that is so incredibly liberating so can anybody learn mindfulness even people who say oh i can't meditate can they learn <laughs> mindfulness yeah especially those people especially those people i was one of those people because the idea of meditating it kind of petrified me like the last thing I wanted to do was sit and be alone with my thoughts. I, I did everything to try and escape them. And we all, particularly in this modern age, we live in this age of distraction. Boredom is kind of a thing of the past. There's no opportunity to get bored even for a split second because we've already opened up our phone or we're, we're looking at something else or switching on the telly. And actually, for so many people, to sit and to meditate is this kind of act of bravery. 
And certainly, I think many people have this idea still of meditation as clearing the mind. And of course, it, it isn't that. And certainly with mindfulness meditation, we're never trying to push away thought because that tends to uh, make it come on stronger. It's like lying in bed in the middle of the night and don't think, go away thoughts. And of course, they get louder and louder or that don't think of a white elephant and the white elephant appears. Actually, how we how we allow the mind to settle down is through this state of allowing and being able to, can I just be with what is? Can I allow those trains of thought to come along, but see that it is absolutely possible for me to not get on board every single train? Can I just be here where I am? Can I allow these thoughts to come and allow them to go off on their own journey while I remain in the meditation? And of course, at first, everyone pretty much finds that a challenge people find that very uh that the mind is very busy because we're used to having a busy mind we're used to being stuck on overthink and these circles of rumination but as soon as we see that it's possible to sit back from that and we see thoughts for what they really are then quite quickly we can learn to just let them come and let them go which uh, is so remarkable when we first see that for ourselves. I remember first seeing that for myself, of being able to, I'm here, but the thoughts are there. And so what does that mean? It means that I'm separate to my thoughts. And actually, thank goodness for that. If I'm separate to my thoughts, then I'm not my thoughts. And this is such an important realization it's such a pivotal part of what allows us to go deeper into our practice and actually that's why I entitled the book uh, you are not your thoughts because when I had that penny drop moment in meditation and I could directly experience that for myself it really transformed everything for me it transformed my relationship with those thoughts going forward both in meditation and in life. And ultimately, that's why we're doing the meditation, not to be incredible meditators, but to be better at living life and really showing up and being present for this life. So if we mention life, um, perhaps on a more personal note that's relevant though to you and me and, and many, many other people, you have young children and I have youngest children and, and many other people, um, live life in, in a period where just life happens to them, perhaps. They have to be attentive, they have other people's needs to consider, young people's needs. How can you bring mindfulness um, if you have a young family? Well, actually, I think if you have a young family, we have a very unique opportunity to recognize that we're living with little Zen masters. When, when our little people are very little, they are incredibly mindful. In fact, when, when they're born, when we're born, we, uh, we're very present. We're completely in the moment. We're not off planning or thinking about the past or, or, or anything like that. We are just where we are. And watching, uh, watching my youngest play uh, at the moment, Lego is a thing because he's six. And he kind of gets into the zone and I can just see him there playing with these Lego figures and just um, being so present or running around in the garden, kicking a football and just the aliveness buzzing around him. It's kind of infectious. And we can certainly, I think as parents, because um, there are so many pressures and we're pulled in so many different directions, we can feel like we constantly need to be teaching our children. And, um, and of course, there's elements of that that do, do need to happen. But actually, just offering them this space in which to be is the best way of allowing them to, to kind of maintain that ability to be mindful rather than having to teach them mindfulness or teaching them to sit still and certain techniques at 
actually they're very mindful already and and we can learn from that we can learn from them to kind of put down all of our doing and just have a kick about in the garden or have a bit of a, a dance around the kitchen and actually it doesn't have to be difficult and it doesn't have to be forced they remind us that actually it's the most natural state of being is this being mindfulness yeah so we can learn mindfulness from our children absolutely absolutely and then these children get older and become uh, young adults and i know more and more schools today are um, teaching mindfulness because um obviously young adults are um, sometimes doing exams or um, are off uh, to university to study how uh, can young adults benefit from learning mindfulness? How could they integrate it in their lives? And I think your book perhaps talks about that a bit as well. Um, but what are your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. The book um, reviews have been, well, it's been absolutely overwhelming, actually, to, to put something out there and, and get so much feedback from, from all, all over the place. And, and one of the uh, fantastic kind of professional reviewers was very much saying that how suited this particular book was for young adults and, and teenagers because of the simplicity of it. Uh, and so actually, I think it is just this state of keeping it simple. I, I, for me personally, even when I first fell in love with mindfulness, there is this tendency that we all have to kind of intellectualize uh, about something and get very uh, very deep into kind of the backgrounds and the theory but actually that kind of all takes us away from this essential state of being and um, and so I've spent quite a lot of time going in and teaching in schools and these these teen years and kind of young adult years are so key for really the ego getting ramped up and kind of seizing uh, seizing so much of our attention so it's wonderful actually that schools are taking this seriously and equipping children young adults with these skills uh, because particularly I mean I wouldn't like to be a teenager right now with all the social media it was it was horrendous enough as it was but uh having to present this profile having to kind of define who you are at such an early age it's kind of frightening really because actually those are the years where we should just be much more open about exploring who it is we are without this kind of need to define and confine ourselves by that definition and chart all of that for the world to see uh, on the internet. So um, very, very important in terms of mental health that there is this ability to be able to have some space away from that, to have this connection to reality rather than being lost in that black mirror that is the phone that sucks us off into a different di dimension and <laughs> transports us elsewhere. Uh, very, yeah, very important for us to try and set an example really to our young people to spend some time away from that phone and away from social media. So uh, while I won't claim to be an expert in that, um, I can certainly see with the amount of young people that I get in my uh, in my therapy studio that uh, that actually this is all having a rather detrimental effect. All of this um, social media and so having those skills and even the simplicity of finding the breath, panic and anxiety is just so rife uh, for our young people and understanding uh, how we can change how we breathe to change how we feel I found so so useful with some of those young people absolutely so young people young adults teenagers can also 
benefit from learning mindfulness, how to live more mindfully. And what would you recommend if you could provide one uh, piece of advice for those people who would like to practice mindfulness and don't know where to start? And other than, of course, uh, reading the book, where you can find uh, many, many, um, many, many uh, pieces of advice and information on why you are not your thoughts. If you had one piece of advice, what would it be? Switch the phone off for 10 minutes <laughs> and go in your garden and find your breath and listen to the birds. Is that several pieces of advice? I think, <laughs> I think you know, just, just switching that phone off, listening to the birds. It is as simple as that. And yet, as we all know, it's really difficult to do at times because our minds would convince us that there are a million other things that are so much more important than, than doing that. There are so many other things uh, that are pulling us for our uh, attention. But actually, I find with so many of the people that I've worked with and with myself that actually a lot of the time that distraction and prioritizing everything else above our mental health comes from this thing that we all have, this underlying feeling that everything is a bit more important than us, that we're kind of not really enough. And actually becoming aware of how that pulls on us and plays on us is really important to say, actually, no, my mental health, my well-being is the foundation of everything. It's the foundation of how much work I get done because otherwise I'm off worrying or procrastinating. It's the foundation of the relationships that I have and the way that I relate to people and how present I'm able to be in a conversation with those people that I love. It is the basis of how we feel about everything in our lives. And so actually taking just five minutes, 10 minutes to sit outside and listen to those birds and feel our breath is quite possibly the most important thing we can do. There's, there's nothing more important than that. And how about um, those of us who can take a bit more than, than uh, a few minutes? Um, retreats, I know you teach courses and you do training, one-on-one -on -one training, and um, I know you also like to do retreats. Can you um, tell us more about how retreats can help? Mindfulness, <laughs> what kind of retreats should we seek, perhaps? Well, I um, uh, I was formerly a thinking addict, <laughs> and now I'm a retreat addict. I I love to go on retreats. I uh, for me, it's such an essential part of my practice to be able to stay incredibly grounded and open it's essential for me to go on a lot of retreats and I do do a lot of retreats. So uh, I'm a big fan of, um, I do love a silent retreat. That's great because it allows everything to settle down uh, in the mind and it allows us to just really be incredibly present. I'm also a huge fan uh, of, um, of an enlightenment intensive. I've done many of those and uh, if, if you've not done one, you absolutely should. Uh, uh, Zen Ways actually um, run, some, I've just got back from last weekend, uh, a Zen intensive uh, where over three days you're working with a dyad in dyads, which is in pairs, working on spiritual questions. Uh, so, for instance, most people would start on who am I, kind of the big who am I. And uh, and you do, if you stick to the process and really go for it, uh, you do get to the very heart, that direct experience of who you really are. And waking up to this and seeing that directly is probably one of the most important things we can do with our lives. So if you haven't done an enlightenment intensive or a Zen intensive, then do seek one out. It's hard work. Uh, it's a bit like running a marathon or multiple marathons. 
and um, yeah, it's not all pleasant. Some of it can be a bit of a bumpy ride, but it's uh, a remarkable, a remarkable thing to do. And for me, an essential part of my practice that keeps me grounded in this who I really am, rather than sucked away into uh, the world of all the human beingness because we've we, we've all the human doingness sorry we we get so swept up in all this doing that we have to do we forget that we're this human being underneath it all so uh, I I know that I it's something I I need uh, and I I do definitely advise people to seek that out that is wonderful advice. Thank you so much, Francis. Could you just tell us if people wanted to get in touch with you and work with you, how could they do that? So uh, mindfullyhappy.com is my website. Uh, do There's various different free resources that are available from there. So I have a Mindfully Happy podcast with lots of free meditations and talks. There's also the Mindfully Happy YouTube channel. Uh, which we have some teachings on, but also uh, via that website as well, you can get in touch to, I do lots of stuff uh, on Skype with people from all around the world uh, and lots of stuff in person here in London. So Wonderful. It's been really wonderful speaking with you, Francis, author of You Are Not Your Thoughts, The Secret Magic of Mindfulness. Thank you, Francis. Thank you so much, Daniela. This is Daniela Norris on All Books Presents, podcast and interview series. All Books publishes great books on the mind, body, spirit connection. And my guest today was Francis Trussell, author of You Are Not Your Thoughts, The Secret Magic of Mindfulness. Francis is a teacher and she has a wonderful website where you can learn more about mindfulness, www.mindfullyhappy.com. Thank you for listening.